Welcome. I'm Sophia Vogel, president of the Friends of Hannon Library at Southern Oregon University. Uh, the Friends works to raise funds to enrich the library's offerings from adding rare books to the Marjorie Bailey Special Shakespeare Collection to adding special databases that enhance student research projects. We also put on this speaker series event to help bring our students, faculty, and the community together. Um, if you too believe in the awesome power of libraries to make the world a better place, please join us and become a member of the Friends of Hannon Library, and um, we'll post a link in the Q&A in, in a minute. And if you happen to find yourself with some free time on your hands, as I'm, I'm sure most of you do, and if you have a, a great love of literature and libraries, we are currently looking for a new community board member who would like to um, join us to help make these events happen. Uh, tonight, we have, but I'm an American citizen with Roy Saigo, our well-loved former Southern Oregon University president, speaking to us on the incarceration of people of Japanese ancestry during World War II. He will review the conditions before, during, and after the imprisonment of Japanese Americans from a very personal perspective. And this is our fourth event of our seven-part speaker series. And just to keep you up to date, our next event takes place March 10th, 7 p.m. The title is Only Hope, My Mother and the Holocaust Brought to Light. Irv Lubliner, who is a SOU Emeritus Professor, shares the story of his mother's writings about her experience during the Holocaust. And I'll put the link in the Q&A. Uh, let's see. Before we begin this virtual event, it's our tradition at Southern Oregon University to take a moment to acknowledge our connection to this land, its history, and its present. The following is a formal land acknowledgement written by the members of the Native American Studies Program here at SOU. We want to take this moment to acknowledge that Southern Oregon University is located within the ancestral homelands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Latgawa peoples who lived here since time immemorial. These tribes were displaced during rapid Euro-American colonization, the gold rush, and armed conflict between 1851 and 1856. In the 1850s, discovery of gold and settlement brought thousands of Euro-Americans to their lands, leading to warfare, epidemics, starvation, and villages being burned. In 1853, the first of several treaties were signed, confederating these tribes and others who would then be referred to as the Rogue River Tribe. These treaties ceded most of their homelands to the United States, and in return, they were guaranteed a permanent homeland reserved for them. At the end of the Rogue River Wars in 1856, these tribes and many other tribes from Western Oregon were removed to the Silets Reservation and the Grand Ronde Reservation. Today, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Silets Indians are living descendants of the Tecumla Shasta and Latgawa peoples of this area. We encourage you to learn about the land you reside on and to join us in advocating for the inherent sovereignty of indigenous people. Okay, now, before I turn this over to our host tonight, I'm going to go over just a few technical items. You may have noticed already that this event is being recorded. Uh, because this is a webinar rather than a normal Zoom, you'll not be able to see yourself and you will be muted during the presentation. Uh, we have the chat feature disabled, but the Q&A feature is available, and I will read any questions that you have, which I hope you have some, at the end for our speaker to answer. And you can, um, that'll, that's exactly how you can do it, is just put your question in the Q&A. If you're having technical difficulties, you can email the tech help link that was found in the registration email. Also, many thanks to Erica Knotts for running this webinar from behind the scenes. Um, and without further ado tonight, we have a champion of tolerance and non-exclusion to share his insights into these important topics. Without further ado, Roy Saigo. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you, Sophia. And thank you, Erica. Uh, Dale, so good to see you again. And uh, thank all of you for uh, signing up to attend this uh, presentation. The uh, Friends of the Hannon Library uh, for this invitation. And um, I know my friends in 
New England are listening in and uh, it's late there. It's uh, 10 o'clock or, or later. And um, also many of you who are missing the Olympics, I appreciate you taking time to uh, chime in. I uh, hope that we working together can share some experiences and that um, we have a better understanding of human behavior at the end of my presentation. I am going to ask you to do something that's very, very difficult. Uh, frequently when people lecture, they don't ask you to participate, but I am going to have you, uh, if you will, to transform yourselves to a different person. I would like you to feel uh, like a different person. This is not uh, an easy thing to do, but uh, if you would work very, very uh, hard at it, it's like practicing athletics. It's like learning a new uh, topic, language, music, math, any activity, it will take some effort on your part. So we are starting today by my asking you to imagine that you look different. Your language is different. Your customs and culture are different. You eat with sticks. Your parents are Japanese immigrants. Also, the time is different. It is early 1940s. You have no TV, no computers, no internet, no handheld phones, smartphones, no internet, no interstate highways. If you want to travel far, in those days, you would go by bus or train. Your main sources of information are radios and newspapers. No McDonald's, no yogurt, no smoothies, no shopping malls. And many of you in the audience, I'm sure, have lived this life as I have during that time. It's kind of pretty sad, isn't it, compared to what we're experiencing today. Now, I hope you're ready to transform yourself and to go on this trip with me. It's not sharing. It is sharing. We can see your slides just fine. OK, I'm not able to advance them. Hmm. No. Hmm. Do you want to um, escape presentation mode and go back into it and see if that'll do it? OK. Sorry, folks. No worries. I think everybody at this point is very used to technical difficulties. OK. Let me see. Don't panic. We're going to just plot for a minute. There we go. OK. Ta-da, magic. OK, we're going to move pretty quickly. These are conditions before the personal difficulties that we're going to talk about. World War II is in progress, most fighting the Nazis in Europe. Japanese military is starting to gear up. The Imperial forces of Japan attacked the American fleet in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And I don't know if you're able to notice the previous slide that the attack by Japan was anticipated and reported in the newspaper article. When it actually happened, it focused on military targets. The news of Pearl Harbor attack was covered, of course, and uh, you'll see all the different newspaper coverage of that attack. The war is on. This is a headline in a Japanese English newspaper uh, published on that day. I have a few slides illustrating the significance of how propaganda is used. Propaganda is important to get a populace fully in support of fighting an enemy. Posters, slogans, fire speeches, and movies 
are much stronger than the written newspaper reports. Propaganda clarifies the idea of us versus them. We are the good guys and they are bad. They are evil, they are sneaky, not to be trusted. You will see a trend in depicting the enemy. First, emphasize distrust. Some of the World War II propaganda was so extreme that its effects are still having impact on anti-Asian racism to this day. I have a few of the hundreds of examples to share with you. Second, engage patriotism. Work on engaging the people, making individuals feel they are a part of the team. For example, just watch any NFL football audience waving white flags. This is buying into the effort. Patriotism is a gut level positive force for motivating behavior, especially again, when we are good and they are evil. This propaganda encourages people to feel they are helping in the war effort by being industrious, being vigilant and giving, sacrificing their time and money. There was wartime rationing of meat, butter, sugar and other commodities and some of us older people remember margarine, nuco, remember mixing it up with dye. People donated metal objects to be converted to war machines. They planted victory gardens to increase self-sufficiency and provide for things they couldn't easily get at the grocery store because of shortages of labor, harvesting, and transportation. Some of you may actually have been a part of helping your grandparents or parents. Third, use propaganda to stir up anger and hatred. And you'll see these pictures, they're pretty, uh, pretty ghastly. Fourth, turn the enemy into a frightening and disgusting caricature. Create ghoulish images that increasingly go to subhuman exaggeration. It's interesting here that vestiges of anti-Black racism also seem to be thrown into the mix. Then go from ugly human caricatures to animals. Reduce the enemy to something horrible, something less than human. They are despicable, likened here to mosquitoes, rats, snakes, and some of the vampiric goal. It is easy to scare people and develop hate with these images. Finally, treat them fully as animals to be hunted and killed. Have you followed the progress, distrust, patriotism, subhuman to animals, to bounties? How are you feeling now as a Japanese American at this time? People look at you, despising you for what you look like, tell you to go back to where you came from. Are you thinking, wait, I was born here? This is truly grotesque, degrading propaganda. Unfortunately, it had been done before. Members of the military campaign against Native Americans in the 1800s was one of the exterminations, terminology that is used for unwanted animals. Boundaries were offered for heads, scalps, ears, and other body parts. Propaganda is a powerful too. I hope you are still with me on this journey. This is the kind of ugly work that contributed to public acceptance of the removal and incarceration of approximately 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast of the United States. Most were American citizens. Most of us were children. Even more, however, all of these kinds of propaganda created images and prejudices that still exist. People remember the loss of loved ones to Asian wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So who were the Americans of Japanese descent who were affected? That's you and me. All right, this is you. All of you, all of you, 
have 10 days or less to leave your homes and businesses. This order includes you and your entire family, parents, siblings, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and may include you if you are even 1 16th Japanese. You will be labeled as Japs, the same pejorative term used for the war enemy, and having the same derogatory impact as the N-word. You have no due process. You will be removed. So what do you feel? Confusion, disbelief, fear, indignation, outrage, urgency, panic, hopelessness, despair. These are notices that were tacked up in public areas to be read by many of the Japanese in the community. And, you know, let's take a moment to remind ourselves that all of you in the audience, as the people who were incarcerated, 120,000, we all have different stories to tell, similar experiences. But what I'm trying to do this evening is to give you a presentation of what I and my family experienced. All right, one day we were productive, educated, industrious members of society. The next day we were publicly labeled with suspicion. Yes, and even a sense of guilt, a sense of being partially responsible. I know it makes no sense and would take much more time to fully discuss this issue. However, I feel many in that generation feel badly and therefore don't want to speak about the experience. Summarily, without due process or appeal, we were targeted for mass evacuation, removal from our homes. For our own protection, they said, and military necessity. Whatever the age or occupation of you in the audience, you are going to be removed to a place away from the West Coast. And you don't know where that is going to be. You know, we were a law-abiding community. We followed what the US government decreed. We went without protest or uprising with a philosophy of showing we're good participants in American society. Two thirds of us were American citizens, 40% were children. Out of fear, we destroyed priceless photographs and other tokens of family history, especially anything that could be connected to Japan. We do not have much Saigo family history. We destroyed all of our picture album, albums, wedding pictures, tea sets, artwork, memorabilia, business information. And I remember my family telling of taking all the dishes and things and throwing them into a ravine in a creek, uh, burning up with gasoline, all of the remnants of our history there in Vacaville. We didn't want strangers to be rummaging through all of our belongings. Italy and Germany were fighting against the US and its allies, but they were not subjected to exclusion. Even though they live mostly in or near major cities and strategic areas, many of the Germans were refugees from Nazi Germany. There was a history of anti-Asian settlement to build upon Asian Exclusion Acts. Since the early 1900s, Asians had been in target of laws restricting their immigration, their rights to own land, jobs, education, and daily freedoms. There was also a history of resentment for success. The Japanese immigrants to the West Coast worked hard to make a living in spite of hardships. They directed their energies into agriculture with great su success, competing with land-owning agricultural families and companies, especially in California. They were able to make marginal land productive. They developed supportive community-based businesses.
we're charged with wanting to get rid of the Japs for our selfish reasons. We do. We'd never miss them. White farmers can take over and we don't want them back when the war ends either. Written by Managing Secretary Taylor, Salinas Vegetable Growers, May 9th, 1942, under the title, People Nobody Wants in the Saturday Evening Post. And many of you may be familiar with that famous magazine. Not only were the agriculture leaders against the Japanese farmers, so were the newspapers. I quote W.H. Anderson, LA Times, February 2nd, 1942, titled The Question of Japanese Americans. A viper is nonetheless a viper wherever the egg is hatched. A leopard's spots are the same, its disposition is the same wherever it is whelped. So a Japanese American born of Japanese parents grows up to be Japanese, not American. In fact, the three governors, the Hearst newspapers, the San Francisco Chronicle, and even the New York Times were in support of incarcerating the people of Japanese ancestry. Hey, hey, all of you in the audience, the vegetable growers, the newspapers, political leaders, they don't want you. Are you feeling pretty good right, right, now, right now? General DeWitt, the very fact that no sabotage has taken place to date is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. Does that make any sense? There's no win on this one. DeWitt was the Western Defense Commander. He was in charge of the entire West Coast. He is famous for his report to President Roosevelt. Again, he reported, a Jap is a Jap, meaning there's no difference even if he were an American citizen. Again, the same, same song. His report says, can't tell a sheep from a goat. Again, being likened to goats and animals. The report influenced the Supreme Court decision on the Korematsu case, which I will again mention later. Many people were farmers, especially in Oregon, Washington, and California. Some were able to harvest their crops and others were not. The War Relocation Authority contracted two famous photographers to create a record of the internment, Ansel Adams and Dorothea Lane. We are using many of their photographs this evening. You know, just look at these faces, hardworking, optimistic, they earned their success by hard work, by striving to be good citizens. The removal occurred by organized stages. First, the people were reporting to the neighborhood centers to register. Then they were evacuated under the supervision of the US Army and taken to assembly centers for temporary housing. This is being done while the permanent facilities were being built. And finally, we were taken to the long-term camps by bus, truck, and train. First, we were assembled at temporary sites of smaller icons. You can see the smaller icons on the map. These are the assembly centers. Subsequently, we were sent to relocation, located inland from the Pacific coast, the squares, these are the big ones. My family, if you can find it, from Sacramento in California to Gila River, Arizona in the hot, dry desert near Phoenix. And again, that's a long way to go. And remember, we were in idyllic, good conditions before we were shipped off to Arizona. This is a uh, pictures of uh, leaving Bainbridge, the photo of the man saying goodbye to the family pit really touches me because we have pets and I'm sure many of you do too. What are you gonna do with your pets? The soldiers with fixed bayonets, women and children, 
Army trucks brought people to the train station. And finally, we are still waving an American flag. 227 Japanese Americans were ordered to leave Bainbridge Island with six days notice. They departed by ferry on March 30th, 1942. The island had a total of 276 Japanese American citizens, those who were away from the island at the time due to study, military service, or other business were not permitted to return. Leaving San Francisco, many layers, one group leaves and then the other waves, but they too will be leaving shortly after. Are you wondering what you did wrong? We were taught to work hard, be good citizens, stay out of trouble, not to bring shame or dishonor on our families and always to behave in a way that showed our respect and patriotism for the US. Same as what all of you are watching believe. The next slide is, is really a troublesome one because it makes all of us dig into our own personal needs. What would you take? You can only take what you can carry. Of course, some clothes, toiletries, bedding, eating, eating utensils, but you don't have much room for anything else. What would your family do with your house, your car? And I've had students say, well, we'll sell it, but you'll have only three or four days. You can't get rid of stuff in three or three days and the neighbors can have it for free. Furniture, dishes, silver, guns, photo albums, toys, heirlooms, and you saw the pets. Crops in the field, farm animals. Professional positions were left. We were pulled from schools, universities, and medical schools. We went without protest or uprising with philosophy of showing we were good cooperative and patriotic participants in American society. She got the nigh. It cannot be helped. Come body, keep going no matter what. And how many times did I hear these words over and over and over from my parents? They did not speak English. Some by bus, some by train, some by cars or trucks. Where are we going? Nobody would tell us. And when we we're on the trains and buses, we had to pull the shades down. What was the government and military going to do with us? First, they took us, some of us, to racetracks that had been hastily converted to assembly centers. They were big. They had lights, they had fences, and they had stalls. Some assembly centers were fairgrounds where the livestock buildings were then converted for people. So here we are. What are you thinking? Is this the Hilton? Families were dressed nicely for travel. They wanted to arrive respectfully, attired for whomever and whatever. I'm sure they were expecting human habitation. I don't think any of them expected this. Last night, you were in your own cozy bed. Tonight, you are in a horse stall that reeks of urine and manure. Tonight, you will have a bear cot the mattress internees were given mattress bags and a supply of straw to stuff into them. The smell, the facilities fit for a horse. Was it hot or cold? Air conditioning? No. Bathroom and shower? Privacy? No. What are we feeling? From the assembly centers, People were moved to the inland relocation centers. The layout of Manzanar was typical of military camp with rows of buildings called barracks. Each barrack housed up to four families, strangers to all of us. All communal eating, communal bathing, 
and latrines. No privacy. For example, the latrines had no doors or stalls, just side-by-side -side toilets. The bathhouses had rows of showers with no doors or curtains. Just like it reminds me of when we were in high school and playing sports. It was especially hard on the older adults. What you worked on for a lifetime of dreams and efforts is now this. Hopeless, nobody stood up for you. Days and hands are empty of livelihood, control, and hope. So this is personal space, your room, which you may share with the rest of your family. This gentleman was really an innovative. He constructed a clothesline closet for his belongings. I was asked, what was life like in camp? I was two and a half to five years old, and my memories are augmented by family and my brothers and sisters. As children, we did not fully grasp the reality and the seriousness of what was happening to our families. Each barrack typically divided into four units. Imagine yourself sharing a 2020 space with your entire family or entire our family. Communal missiles, latrine showers, no stalls, humiliating, especially for the adults, some improvised privacy with cardboard. We had long lines with every meal. We brought our own plates and cups, blowing dust and sand most of the year. And that's what we were dealing with. At the relocation centers, residents helped to complete the development of their environment. War Relocation Authority or WRA provided government rations, schools and infirmaries, soldiers to guard and police the camps. But residents were tasked with organizing themselves into a town community. Blocks of barracks identified as civic units and internees were elected to govern, work with government on camp needs and concerns. So there was communication going on. Internees were expected to work to complete and maintain facilities and utilities, grow crops, raise livestock. Work at Gila Bend also included military contracts for dehydrating and canning food, growing vegetables for other camps, and briefly making camouflage nets, basically to recreate a functional community. And I'm amazed at how well they came together to provide this organization. Since the presence of armed soldiers and Bob War was a daily reminder, we're not in fun-filled camps. We were prisoners. The internees organized schools and school-related activities, band and sports, especially baseball. Baseball was especially a big uh, time consumer for the community. They developed festivals, newspapers, classes on traditional arts, culture, and social activities and even entertainment. They landscaped the barren ground around our barracks. Overall, they tried to create a normal and environment as soon as possible. My family was taken to Arizona near Phoenix, the Gila River Relocation Center. This is my older brother Takishi with me in front of our wartime home in Gila. And I wonder if you can put your face on this photo. Can you put yourself in my or my brother's place? The federal government negotiated to lease 16,500 acres on the Pima Indian Reservation for the two Gila River camps. Some of the other camps also were located on tribal lands. Have any of you ever been to Arizona desert in the middle of summer? So here we have army style camp, Note the rows of barracks, plus the common bathrooms, shower houses, and mess halls. The smaller photo show produce that was grown at Gila and sent to other camps. Because there was irrigation from the Gila River, this camp provided vegetables to some of the other camps. In fiscal year 1944, Gila River was responsible for sending over 4 million pounds of produce 
for consumption to eight of the other WAR camps. This will give you a close up idea of the arrangement at Canal Camp, one of the two camps at Gila River. It had about 5,000 people at peak occupancy. Each of the black rectangles, barracks, housed three to four families, single persons at smaller spaces. Note schools and open spaces that were used for sports and community events. This is the other camp at Gila River. It had about 10,000 people at the peak. All together, the two Gila River facilities end up holding about 3,000 more people than they had been designed for. As I mentioned, the communal buildings were communal in the full sense and no privacy. My mother often said that she would get us up extra early to make sure that we beat the crowd at the bathrooms and showers. We stood in line for everything, for bathing, toilet, dining, and with the hot, dry, or cold winter uh, weather and blowing dust and sand all the time. I've included this closer view of a barracks building to show several things. This was in the very hot Arizona desert. The dark buildings were painted white. There is a double vented roof to allow some heat to escape. It also shows how carefully individual buildings were maintained by the residents. It shows an example of community activity, a harvest festival, which also had a parade and performances. Residents tried really hard to preserve some normality to their life in captivity. Notice also that the people kept themselves neatly dressed and proper for special occasions like this. Remember the photo of the Manzanar of bare bones interior of barracks? No furniture, but a cot. Internees helped to build the barracks and other buildings. Piles of scrap lumber were left as I mentioned earlier, when people arrived, they began building tables, chairs, dressers, cabinets, and shelves from this leftover lumber. Later, women ordered fabric and other things from, I think many of you remember Montgomery Wards and Sears, Spiegel, where you can order things from the catalog. And once the basics of life had been developed again, the families tried to develop some theme, uh, feelings of home. For adults, the loss of freedom and livelihood was deeply felt, but they made the best of it. Gaman, Japanese word, be resilient, tough it out, be steady. For children, teens and young adults, they had lots of friends. They could gather freely, play games and be socialized. It was pretty carefree. In fact, many of the videos I watched of other internees who are now my age, uh, they were children at the time, didn't seem to have very bad memories, and that's a good thing. However, this created concerns among grandparents and parents. It changed the traditional family structure. Extended families, aunts, uncles, grandparents were in widely distributed and segregated or separated barracks. Children and parents spent less time together and traditional ideas of togetherness, duty and respect became less a part of family life. Less family influence on dating and marriages. Some people were located in lower population areas in the United States, were not sent to relocation centers Instead, they were sent to Eastern Oregon and Idaho to work on truck farms. They were needed to harvest potatoes, onions, and other produce. Some of the FSA camps used existing buildings plus military tent barracks. I read where some were housed in former chicken houses and literally used as indentured servants. Group wash areas and latrines were constructed as shown in the two photographs. All right, now we're transitioning from the camps to the war effort. This was going on at the same time, remember. 
The U.S. government decided to form an all-Japanese-American military unit. It combined Americans from Hawaii who were living free with volunteers who were living behind barbed wire in the mainland camps. Have you thought about why the Hawaiians were not incarcerated? That is another lecture, but basically, it was decided that incarcerating the Hawaiian Japanese would strangle the entire economic system of the island. However, this was Pearl Harbor. This is where the attack took place. This is where all the, uh, the, the spies and espionage would be taking place. But because of the economy, they didn't herd up and relocate the Japanese population. It was all economics from the very beginning. Japanese American and African American troops were in segregated units. In both cases, they were initially to provide support. Only later did the US government decide to put these soldiers into battle. Probably the most famous engagement of the 442nd soldiers was rescuing the last, the lost battalion. General Dahlquist from Minnesota sent the 442nd in to rescue 200 trapped Texans. In the process, the FAR-2 recorded 800 casualties, including 121 killed. I oftentimes felt if this was a fair exchange, is this the price of showing loyalty? Imagine yourselves again, you are fighting the enemy. Why? To provide that you are loyal to America, that you are not the enemy. In the end, they were the most highly decorated unit. Imagine your family is jailed by the US government for being who you are. Your older brother is fighting for the US. Is this fair? General Dawkins, senior Senator Daniel K. Inoue from Hawaii. He was then a second lieutenant in the 442. He lost his arm in that battle. When General Dahlquist called the regiment out for a retreat parade to commend us personally, he reported to have said to the commanding officer, Colonel, I ask that your entire regiment be present for this occasion. Where are the rest of your men? Colonel Charles Pence replied, sir, you're looking at the entire regiment except for two men on guard duty for each company. This is all that is left of the 442nd. Not a single company was at even half its strength. Inouye's Company E had only 40 of 107, 197 men remaining. Later at a memorial event, a Lieutenant Colonel was approached by a four-star General Dahlquist. He saluted, but refused to shake hands and turned away. Many of the senior officers criticized the general and the way he used and sacrificed the members of the 442. None of the Japanese Americans were senior officers. Although the nation is respectful and appreciative of the valor of the 442, many felt they were used as cannon fodder. The valor and extreme sacrifices of the 442 earned the respect and admiration of General Clark. Even so, fewer medals were awarded to the Japanese Americans who were wounded, killed, and displayed extraordinary valor than were awarded to their counterparts. Partially remedied in 2000. For example, only one Medal of Honor was awarded in the 1940s, a grotesque imbalance and in 2000, 21 Medals of Honor were rewarded. President Harry Truman, what a wonderful statement from President Harry Truman. However, I am sad to say the president is still embedded deeply in our society. Just recently reports show that crimes against Asian Americans were up by 342% in the US largest metro areas. This was a report, a study by the Center for Hate and Extremism at Cal State Santa Bernardino. 
I show this slide to reflect the sacrifices of the Japanese American combat team, their lives, body, courage, spirit for their home country. Even right after the war, prejudice prevailed. Again, Senator Inoue remembers going in to get a haircut and was told by the barber that he didn't cut Jap hair. He said he wanted to tear up the entire barbershop, but, they had, but he had done too much fighting and he just left. While doing my research, a picture I remember so vividly was the Medal of Honor placed on the top of a folded American flag being presented to the mother of a deceased soldier. And she was behind Bob Wire. This is an upbeat official news report in the Phoenix Republic. It portrays a poignant message. Notice the euphemism of evacuees term usually applies to people fleeing disaster areas such as earthquakes and war zones. So again, were we internees, detainees, or prisoners? This photo shows how residents made the best of it, making a home for how long, they don't know. They developed gardens and made the barracks as homey as possible. When the residents were released, they were told to leave and the buildings were sold at auction. Residents were not allowed to bid on the camp buildings. They had helped to build and improve. In fact, when we visited Tule Lake, and you can do that, we saw some of the buildings that had been removed from the original location. Today, not much of the camp remains. However, there is one barrack building at the Klamath Falls County Museum at the fairgrounds. Now we are transitioning to legal issues that were taking place while we were being transported to inland locations. In the 1940s, a few cases related to Japanese internment went to the US Supreme Court. These were not cases of disloyalty or espionage, but mainly of risking oneself to challenge what was happening. Again, there was no act of disloyalty or espionage. Hirabayashi, his conviction on May 16, 1942, for breaking the curfew law was not overturned until 1987. Korematsu, he was caught for running away with a Caucasian girlfriend to Nevada. He was convicted of violating the military exclusion order. His case was not vacated until November, 1983. Minoru Yasui, he stayed out until 11 p.m. demanding to be arrested for violating the curfew. On March 28, March 28, 1942, he was convicted and sent to a year in prison with a $5,000 fine. Yasui had been the first Japanese American to be awarded a law degree from the University of Oregon. The book, Stubborn Twig by Lauren Kessler, Three Generations of Yasui Family in Hood River. I turned, attended Oregon State University with Tommy Yasui, his son. And thankfully, Governor Brown declared March 28th of each year, the Minoru Min Yasui Day. And later, President Obama also gave the Presidential Medal of Honor or Freedom. The Endo case, you don't read as much about, but her case was really, really important. It was this case that the Supreme Court passed unanimously. It allowed us to be legally released. The court ruled on the issue of detention. However, the court did not rule and ignored the constitutional issue of our incarceration. Many times the full story is not revealed for decades. More recently, the former acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal, under President Obama, apologized and released an important report, the Ringo Report, from the Office of Naval Intelligence. Basically, it stated there's no evidence to prove Japanese Americans were a threat. 
In fact, this report reinforced a previous report commissioned by the President Roosevelt, which is called the Curse munson Report from 1941. The Munson Report was supported by the FBI and the Office of Naval Intelligence. And they both said evidence for Japanese American resistance was non-existent. The Ringel Report was deliberately hidden from the Supreme Court by then Solicitor General Fahey, F-A-H-E-Y, during the Korematsu Hirobashi cases. And you can read this. No evidence of espionage, rebellion, fifth column, or other spying activities. I am pleased that so many people and groups tried to right the wrong. It took so many years, 40 years, after so many hours of legal lobbying and volunteer efforts were able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. On August 10th, 1988, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was signed by the President Ronald Reagan. This provided $20,000 for each living person who had been incarcerated. Unfortunately, my father and brother had passed and did not receive any compensation. Actually, to me, the letter of apology was the most important gesture from our government. As noted, Fred Corey Matsu deliberately challenged the constitutionality of the removal and internment. He was arrested, tried, and convicted. His case went to the Supreme Court. Korematsu lost his case by ruling of eight to three, but the words of dissenting Justice Murphy were powerful. And, you know, I think it is so important to remember these words. This exclusion of all persons of Japanese ancestry goes over the very brink of constitutional power and falls into the ugly abyss of racism. I dissent, therefore, from the legalization of racism. Racial discrimination in any form and in any degree has no justification, justifiable part, whatever in our democratic way of life. It is utterly revolting among the free people we have embraced the principles set forth in the Constitution of the United States. All residents of this nation must accordingly be treated at all times as enti entitled to, the, to all the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. The points made in the previous slide are important and should be remembered. Also speaking in the 1940s, Supreme Court Chief Justice Hughes warned of the fragility of the civil rights. And again, uh, seems so appropriate today as then. You may think that the Constitution is your security. It is nothing but a piece of paper. You may think that the statutes are your security. They are nothing but words in a book. You may think that the elaborate mechanism of government is your security. It is nothing at all unless you have sound and uncorrupted uncorrupted public opinion to give life to your constitution, to give vitality to your statutes, to make efficient your government machinery. Eventually the war ended, we were released to return home. Home? We had no home. Our homes are gone. Some people were lucky because friends would live in their homes and keep squatters and looters out. My family stayed in a church gymnasium with blankets hanging on ropes. These partitions gave us some sense of privacy. We stayed there for months until my father got a job for a rancher. We returned to a very hostile environment. We weren't wanted and you saw the vitriol early on. We were still viewed as the enemy. It was easy to pick us out simply because of how we looked. Now, it was no difference whether your age or old or young, educator or professional, it didn't matter. It was all the same. It was, was it the same for German Americans and Italian Americans? No, 
they could blend into the general population. Those hideous caricatures of our Asian faces were burned into the public mind. War-based cartoons and movies played over and over in the theaters. That anger continued to be transferred over to us because we're visible. Many people had friends, fathers, sons, cousins, neighbors killed by Japanese military forces. We were symbolic of the losses and hated. Very difficult to find places to live, work, even to be on the streets, go shopping or go to a restaurant. Many stores and businesses would not allow us to enter or buy. At school, former friends avoided us. Takeshi was 14. He is in his freshman year at high school and they had to crawl through the upper, the legs of the upper classmen. The upper class would have the belts out and they would uh, whip them in the rear. And I remember vividly my mother blotting his buttocks with medicine. When we would go into Sacramento shop, people would stare at us and call us names. Imagine you and your family ostracized and hated. Imagine this treatment as a child or young adult. It was not us as individual human beings. It was against us collectively as an ethnic community. So thank all of you for taking this long and off, often demanding trip with me. We covered 80 years of history. I must share with you that the presentation for this talk was quite demanding. Going back and doing research, listening to videos of incarcerated people took me back to some of my own same emotions. The most emotional for me was to empathize with my parents, people who were at the peak of their lives, having to swallow so much pride, to endure hardships and to try to recapture their strength and their energy and to start all over with a family of four children. Imagine how much energy they had to express to protect their kids, how much empathy to try to minimize the racial attacks, the prejudice, the taunts with pull back eyes and to keep their son or daughters positive. I remember, keep working hard. She got the eye, can't be helped. Ignore it, you're bigger than that. Ignore, don't pay attention, brush it off, study harder. Gambare, suck it up, tighten your belt, be tough, be tough. Look to the future. The many, many times I heard this, Kip, keep your head down, don't make a scene. Well, the people out there who know me know this part didn't stick. I have learned that there's only so much one man can hold his hand in hat, hat in hand and take all of that abuse. You know, a man is a man. I have been president of four universities and that maybe I could have stayed at one longer, but there comes a time when it's wrong, we've got to right the wrong. Because of this experience that I speak for those who have no voice, my studies for this presentation didn't make me mad or depressed, but did make me melancholy. And also made me reflective during these past weeks. But hey, we need to finish my presentation. We talked about how cartoons can affect behavior, beliefs, elicit emotional responses. That newspapers can be prejudiced, biased, and opinionated. Can you believe that? Are we experiencing that today? We had military leaders who were prejudiced that were basically incompetent and were not held up to their responsibility. Government officials like Solicitor General Fahey who actually lied and hid evidence that would have affected the Supreme Court decision. And even the Supreme Court justices who can be prejudiced and unlawful. Does all this seem familiar, cautionary? It seems sad that what we have learned in the past has not become a part of our DNA. Each generation must, be, must learn and become aware of our history 
to avoid the same mistakes. We are all humans. In the USA, we all have rights. As Justice Hughes said, the Constitution is just paper and words, unless it has a knowledgeable and supportive public. Each of us has a responsibility and right to become educated on all manner of issues facing our country and our world. As such, each of us has a responsibility to speak for those who are voiceless. We must speak not just for our own personal benefit and welfare. We must speak for all who are not receiving the benefits of our democracy and the guarantees of our laws. We must do what is right for America. And thank you for your attention. And thank you for this difficult, empathetic transition trip that you took with me. Thank you. That was amazing. I was captivated. That's a terrible word for this, but I was captivated by your, your speech. I couldn't even pay attention to what I was supposed to be doing back here. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing such a, so beautifully your, your journey. And I bet everybody is feeling really inspired by this. We have a lot of questions, more than I've ever gotten on one of these. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll read them out for you. Um, so somebody wants to know what shikata ganai means. I'm not pronouncing shikata nai. Yeah, it's the Japanese word that we heard so often. It's you know, there's nothing we can do about it. So let it pass, let it go. Don't dwell on it. And so yeah, it, there's nothing we can do about it. It's done, and just move on. Ignore it. Don't let it bog you down. When you're when you're stuck like that, I mean, that's literally what a, a prisoner has to do, right? Well, I, I, I'm sure anybody uh, in these conditions and every every community, every ethnicity has a similar words and encouragement to get through tough times. And I'm guessing it's about the same. Yeah, we had a um, couple people asking about about how you rebounded after your release. Um, you and your family, were you able to uh, reconnect to any of your, your history to find old belongings or pictures or things like that? Or they just nothing, it was all gone or? Yeah, we don't have much history. Some of the families did leave the things in their homes and we heard so many wonderful stories of neighbors taking care of their farms and and their houses or the businesses and they came back and they had everything intact. Uh, we weren't so fortunate, but uh, to rebound, you know, uh, I remember my father uh, who came from Japan, he was a national. My mother was born in San Francisco and went back when her uh, mother died and uh, uh, grew up there and then came back here. But I remember him distinctly, even with his bitter, difficult time and uh, taking everything that he had worked for uh, saying, you know what, go to school. And I remember working on farm and he said, if you don't like this, go to school. They can't take education away from you. And then he would finish up by saying, no matter what happened, this is the only country that will allow you to be successful if you work hard. Wow. Okay, there's a lot of questions. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, this Is anyone working to get this information incorporated into history taught at schools? Well, you know, when I gave presentations to high schools in Massachusetts, very little have been heard, of course, in the East. And most of this has been done uh, basically in California and Oregon and, and, uh, and Washington. But yeah, not too much has been said. And uh, so many times uh, when I speak to African-American communities, young people, uh, everybody comes up and says, we never knew that, you know? So yeah, it, this is why I do this. And, uh, uh, but I thank you, uh, Sophia and the Hannon Library for this invitation because this gives us an opportunity to, to discuss the issues. 
Oh, this is this is going to be a really good one up on the on the web on the website. Um, uh, one person asked, can you say a little more about the Supreme Court ruling? Uh, it says, says that they're unclear on how they ruled on the one question, but not the second. In the case of the woman you spoke about, I'm having trouble following that question, but maybe say something more about the Supreme Court ruling. Okay, uh, the uh, three gentlemen who were uh, incarcerated, uh, that those cases were brought up to the Supreme Court and they were all found guilty. And I read the minority report, it was eight to three. And Justice Murphy, uh, and I read the uh, decision, the minority report that he gave that this was uh, basically racism and that the constitution did not support this. And yeah. so, yeah, they were wrong, but hey, we're going through that today with our, uh, I think, Supreme Court with different points of view. Yeah. Um, somebody else um, um, recommends the play Valley of the Heart. Have you heard of that? No, uh, I haven't. Written, uh, I won't even try and pronounce that. Um, it focuses on two neighboring farming families, Japanese and Mexican in the Central Valley of California during the same time period. So something to be considered. Thank you. Yeah, um, let's see. Well, every time I, I get up to a question, it, it, there's more questions. So <laughs> it's, it's moving around for me. Um, uh, Kelly Cummins says, Dr. Saigo, thank you for your insight and service. One of my favorite memories of you is how you tell the story about how your father told you to get an education because it's something no one could take away. Can you expand on how the camps changed the mindset of Japanese Americans? Um, yeah, so did- I can, think the, the, yeah. uh, the second generation, the Nisei, uh, the culture pushed education and that, um, Going to camp, I think that interruption in their lives. In fact, many who were in college were able to go east to finish the degrees. And I noticed uh, recently in my research too that University of California and some of the other California schools and also I think uh, University of Oregon and Oregon State uh, did uh, give uh, degrees to those who are shortchanged when they had to leave. But yeah, uh, yeah education from uh, my family, uh, all of our children were uh, from the very that, uh, time we were little, were expected just to go to college. It was interesting that they, you mentioned they left the physicians behind. Um, did they get swept up later? Um, the Japanese. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I think what uh, what was happening is that we no longer had the immediate uh, influence of the parents, and so when the kids were all playing and and going around, uh, they didn't have as much control of the children on social issues or in marriages and things of that nature. But I think after three and a half years, uh, it came back. But that generation who grew up in that moment, you know. Uh, may, uh, did change uh, a little bit. And the war, of course, and, and we can, uh, there's so much more. The no no boys on the uh, questions of loyalty, and that split the Japanese community uh, because they couldn't uh, uh, say yes, yes to both of those. And they were uh, kept back. And then, uh, so that made a chasm between those who went to war and who, did, who didn't. So those are the issues, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of other comments about, um, you know, thanking you for your your talk and um, little stories. I'm not quite sure how much of this to read. Um, <laughs> let's see, I wonder if you could share. Yeah. I so, do want to jump in real quick, if that's okay, and just say that um, our current president of Southern Oregon University has joined our talk tonight. Um, and Rick would just like to say to you, Roy, um, that on behalf of us at Southern Oregon University, just thank you for honoring us with your presentation tonight, and we really appreciate you. 
Well, thank President Bailey too. Uh, we've been uh, communicating through social media and I wish him the best and we're all here to help him be successful. That's wonderful. Um, uh, let's see. Um, hmm. I'm sorry. I, I'm not. I think. I think we're gonna um, wrap it up here. And uh, I could sit here and read them all, but I feel like there are more personal comments there. So we'll let you can read them separately. Okay. And, Thank you for your talk. This has been amazing. And I know that this could go on and we could talk about current events. It certainly seems like um, the, the propaganda on social media that's going on right now is exactly what your, your last bit that you were talking about. It's like, that's where the power is, is to you know, clean that up and to have better information out there. Well, we, we just got uh, a new TV service and uh, just by accident, I couldn't figure out what to do, but you know, Sophia, there are 10, 15 news channels and those channels seem to be fitting everybody's needs of hearing what they wanna hear. And so I don't know how we're gonna to get to a point where we have uh, ABC, CBS, NBC uh, to all uh, give an unbiased presentation because there's just too many channels that cater to the biases of people. And so I don't know, I guess, uh, President Baylor, we need to educate more people. That sounds like a good plan. All right, <laughs> on that note, um, we're gonna call it a night. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, just remember the Friends of Hannon Library would love to have you as a, as a member and help sponsor events like this. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, and thank you all. I mean, it's been an hour and 15 minutes. You've missed uh, some Olympics, uh, but I hope uh, the presentation was enough to whet your appetite. And maybe you can use the library to look up the Lost Battalion. Maybe you look up the, uh, the Korematsu case. Uh, all of these uh, things can be extended out. Uh, uh, look up the uh, Curtis uh, uh, Mutson case, the Ringo report, all of those things. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's wonderful. And thank you all so much for uh, having this time. Roy, on behalf of Southern Oregon University and the Hannon Library, I want to extend the honor of you get the gold medal for the evening. You also get the, the silver medal and the bronze medal as well. Thank you so much. It's a, a pleasure. 10, Dale, a 10. <laughs> yeah. Thank 10. you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>